Greetings everyone, Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study of the pastoral letters. Uh, and if you're following along, you'd want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll be covering the first eight verses in this study today. 1 Timothy chapter 4. This letter is being written to Timothy, who at the, this time in history is about between 35 and 40 years of age. He's going through some struggles, some discouragements, some disappointments. Uh, and so the Apostle Paul, who is a much older man at this time, is writing to Timothy, seeking to encourage him and to give him some wise counsel. In verse 6, we'll find that it says, if you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. So some of your Bibles might say remembrance. That word is in the present tense, that Timothy needs to keep on reminding them there must be a constant warning about these things. And of course, what are these things referring to? That will be covered in the first five verses of this, uh, this study today. Um, here in chapter four. And so a faithful servant of God is going to be one who is consistently warning you about the issues we find uh, in the in these first five verses of chapter four, Paul begins chapter four with the word now or the word but depends on which and maybe even some of your Bibles don't say that at all. But uh, in the original uh, uh, Greek text, it either says now or but this is a contrasting term um, that that he's using. He's concluding uh, uh, from chapter three by saying um uh, this is godliness. This is what it's all about. Christ has manifested in the flesh. He lived, he died, he rose again. He ascended on high. That is the model. That is the, the description of godliness. And it, and, and it is the works of Jesus Christ, which makes you and me righteous. And it is the works of Christ, which makes you and me uh, godly. So contrasting that... That's what we finished in the last study in chapter three. There are people who say, no, this is godliness, not what you're saying, what this is godliness. And what were those other people saying? All right. If you're not, if you don't have your Bibles, I'll have the, the uh, scripture in the little box below this video. Press pause, read verse one, and then press play again. In the early church, there were those men and women who had the gift of prophecy and the spirit would speak through them and they would predict the future. And what Paul is saying is that whatever, wherever I go, it doesn't matter if I'm in a church in Syria or Greece or Macedonia or Israel, everywhere I go, the spirit is continually warning the church that there comes a time where men and women are going to be departing from the faith. Throughout history of the church, there's been a debate which rages over whether, uh, whether or not it is possible for one to lose their salvation. And in the camp of those who say no, it is an impossibility to lose your faith, that once you're saved, you're always saved. They rely heavily upon the writings of John. Uh, and we find that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, which says, They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. All right, and uh, that's part of verse 19. The fact that they departed proves that they were not saved in the first place. Paul uses the word depart, and the voice that he's using there from the Greek indicates that there is a decision uh, a willful choice. This is what I'm going to do. No, no one's holding a gun to my head. Nobody's forcing me. Uh, uh, now, if you're going to depart from my house, then there's a presumption that you're at my house in order to leave. You do not need to be uh, to, to, to first be in the faith. Um, uh, if you're if if you're departing from from the faith, do you not first need to be in the faith? And so Paul is saying that there is going to come a time where those who are in the faith are going to make a decision to leave the faith. We have all these wonderful promises. Uh, greater is is He that is in me than he who is in the world. Jesus 
said that you're in the palm of my hand and no one can pluck you uh, out from there. Uh, what Paul is warning us here is that it is possible to be deceived um, and to bolt from your faith and to usher in all kinds of harm in your life. Notice in verse 1, Paul says this doctrine originates in hell. Notice now verse 2. So press pause, read 2, and then come back. Even though demons may come up with a doctrine, uh, it takes a human agent, and the human agents who, uh, who are promoting uh, this teaching, Paul says, they are liars, they are actors, uh, and they have violated their conscience. And, and sometimes they end up on Christian TV, uh, and there they're telling us that if you have enough faith, and if you will pray, that God will heal you of everything which is wrong with you instantly. And if you are not instantly healed of every disease, it is because you do not have enough faith. These human agents continue with, we have a solution for that. You need to begin to sow seeds of faith into this ministry. And so you sow faith, financial seeds of faith into this ministry your faith uh, will suddenly grow, uh, you're, you're going to be healed, your, your grandchildren are going to be healed, uh, and they'll be brought to Jesus and so forth and so on. They're making millions of dollars off of this stupid, uh, the stupid and naive sheep uh, out there that are viewing uh, uh, in the viewing world, and they know that what they're doing is wrong, and ever since, uh, and, and every once, in a while, we get one of those TV magazine shows like Primetime or 2020 that will point out the hypocrisy in this ministry, and how these guys are admitting, uh, you know, their, themselves to uh, into hospitals under assumed names because that goes against what they're preaching. And instead of doing that which is right, they continue to violate their conscience. So when you have when you violated your conscience you can do one of a couple things. You can either stop doing what is bugging your conscience or you can continue to do it. And eventually you're going to kill your conscience and that will silence the voice of God which has brought into your life, was brought into your life to lead you into ways of holiness and righteousness. These guys refuse and so their conscience is seared. Now, what was it that they were teaching? All right, press pause now and read verse 3 and then come back. Very early in the church, the Greek philosophy of dualism began to creep in. And dualism said, you have got forces of darkness and you have forces of light. Both of these are equal forces and the forces of darkness are represented in the material realm. You know, if you can see it, if you can touch it, if you can taste it, then uh, you know that you are dealing with the forces of darkness. The forces of light, they're saying, uh, are spiritual. They are, uh, they are those things that, uh, which are invisible to us. So therefore, if you love God and if you want to become a spiritual person, you must begin to deny yourself of these things in the physical realm. Now, physical... Uh, relationship which is enjoyed in a marriage uh, along with food those are the two primary sources of pleasure these guys are coming along and saying you need to deny yourself of these things in order that you might gain a greater level of spirituality he is not talking about people who say I want to go onto the mission field and I think it will be easier for me to remain single Paul dealt with that with the church in Corinthians uh, that's not what he's talking about here. Um, uh, what he's talking about uh, is the person who says, I'm denying myself that physical pleasure. You are not denying yourself of that physical pleasure. Therefore, I am more spiritual than you. Uh, Paul is saying that teaching comes from hell. The same thing is, goes on with food. He's not talking about people who say, look, I've done the research. <coughs> You're far better off living a life of, as a vegetarian, 
you know, if you, you want to do that, it's grand. Uh, nothing wrong with that. What Paul is saying here is when a person says the fact that you eat meat, you eat lobster, you eat shellfish, and you're not supposed to be eating that, I'm not eating those things, and therefore I'm a deeper spiritual person than you, that's false. The interesting thing about legalism uh, and the idea that they that they are more have more spirituality when they uh, they overload themselves with rules, you know, is that legal? You know, is that legalism is a is a guilt managing tool? These folks who are legalistic, they typically have some type of sin going on in their lives, and so what they do is become legalistic to balance their lives in order. Uh, you know, by going overboard with their legalistic behavior. A person who is bound by legalistic rules, uh, if you watch them long enough, eventually they're going to, uh, you will begin to see areas in their life which they are guilty over, and all they're trying to do is offset their guilt through the practice of obeying these rules that they come up with. Notice that Paul says, uh, and this is the contrast, you, you can be righteous by Christ or you can be righteous by a claim that you're celibate or you can be righteous by the claim that I don't eat red meat or whatever. All right, so that's the contrast that he's making here. All right, press pause, read verse 4, and then come back. The word every used there is a very deep word. It means every. Every single creation of, of God is good. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created the animal world, the humanity. Then what did God say? He said, it is all good. Paul comes along and he says to the believers in Ephesus, don't be walking around and saying that this is not good and, this is, and that is not good. The word refused or rejected used there, it has the meaning to cast off as unclean. Don't be going around God's creation saying, this is unclean, that is unclean, this is wrong, or that is wrong. How do we find a balance when we, re uh, we relate to the material realm? Notice that he says in verse 5 that we are sanctified by two things. The first thing we're sanctified with is the word of God. The second is by prayer. The word of God tells us that the Lord is our God and you are not to allow any other God, that's a small g, into your life. And so I am not going to get so wrapped up in materials, uh, the material realm, uh, where another God or another, where a Lord or another addiction or another idol comes into my life. The word of God says we are to live a moderate kind of lifestyle. We could say that God created ice cream, he gave us the raw materials. He gave us the guy who put the materials together who invented ice cream. So therefore, we can say God invented ice cream. But you would not want to live on ice cream 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's probably not going to be a healthy move for you. And so we're talking about moderation here in the uh, material realm. Notice he says, we are to receive it by giving thanks is what you are about to do something you can do in a clear conscience for which you can give thanks to God. Most of us say grace before a meal. Do we also say grace before watching a play, an opera, watching a movie on television, going swimming, painting, boxing, walking, uh, playing, dancing, or whatever? Everything that you do should be uh, in the spirit of thankfulness. Thank the Lord for what you are participating in. All right, press pause, read verses 6 and 7, and then please come back. This is what it's all about. It is not how weird you can become. It's not how goofy we can make ourselves. You know, there are people that go into church services and they begin to bark like dogs or they wave their arms like they're fighting with a sword against war or warfare. It's not about who can outweird the other person, but rather it's all about godliness, is what you are believing in, is what you are chasing after, is that making you a more godly person? And so you go uh, into the church 
and you have this weird trip that you want everyone to follow, well, before we follow you, we're going to sit back and we're going to watch. And we're going to see just what kind of a person the doctrine that you're preaching makes you. What kind of a, what kind of fruit comes out of your life? If it makes you a more godly person, well, then we might slowly begin to get on board with you. Uh, because it's not about being weird, but rather it's about being godly. All right, the final verse in our, our study today is verse 8. So read, uh, press pause, read verse 8, and then come back. There is some value in physical exercise, yet when, what Paul is calling for here is a sense of proportion. You need moderation in your life. If you are an exercise fanatic, understand that you were born, your knees were genetically engineered for, for a certain number of bends uh, in your life. And when you've reached that number of bends in your knees in your life, when that happens and you go past it, your knees are not going to bend anymore without hurting you badly. Uh, and, and if you don't do something about it, you're going to have to go and get a knee replacement. And so if you're running marathons every week, it's going to catch up with you. But where, uh, it, where is the sense for us to want to take such care and such concern for these bodies, these tabernacles, these temporary dwellings uh, that are going to last 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years, if we're lucky, what is the sense to invest all of that energy into something which is nothing more than a vapor uh, in the economy of God for eternity? Meanwhile, we're neglecting that inner man that is going to live with God forever. Where's the wisdom in that? You know, you spend 20 hours a week exercising your body and then you go one hour to church and that's the end of it for the week. You're, you're, you're not reading your Bible. You're not in fellowship. You're not meditating on godly things. And uh, at all throughout the week, uh, wh where is the sense in that? Where is the wisdom in that? The reason why this happened, this is happening in our culture, and, and it's showing up in the church. In our culture today, we spend $110 billion, that's with a B, $110 billion a year on fast food, $85 billion on lawn and garden care. 64 billion a year on soft drinks, 36 billion a year on vending machines, 40 billion on gym memberships and diet plans, 31 billion just on ice cream, 13 billion on chocolate to consume. Do you understand why the world hates Americans? We're like locusts for the uh, in the eyes of the rest of the world. We're consuming much more than our fair share of the earth is resource the earth's resources because of that, we're hated. Do we not have more than what we need? Well, go look in your garage, go look in your storage unit, and and you can answer the question for yourself. Uh, we have way too much than what, than what we need. We will oftentimes take that consumer mentality and we'll bring it into the church. What can the church provide for me? There are churches who have adopted this philosophy and, and, you know, if our church is going to survive, we are going to have to cater to the consumer culture, which we are living in. And there are tens of thousands of churches around our country who uh, who have canvassed the neighbors, the neighborhoods uh, to discover what they are, what, what are the felt needs of the community. And then they begin to treat people like cons like customers and they end up filling their churches with customers rather than disciples. U.S. News and World Report says American religion has taken on the aura of pop psychology. Many congregations have multiplied their memberships by going uh, light on theology and offering worshipers a steady diet of sermons and support groups that emphasize personal fulfillment. Uh, the hottest selling books in Christian stores today are books on uh, uh, offering advice uh, on how to be successful. You remember Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 66, he said, from that time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. The reason why they were turning from Christ is because Jesus said to them, your free lunch is over. I am not here to give 
you a life of consuming material goods. I have come here to give you spiritual life and to prepare you for eternity. And so our Christianity, for the most part, is not who can be the happiest now. It's not who can be the most successful now, but rather it's all about getting ready for the kingdom of God that will one day arrive in, in our lives. For us to be prepared to meet God, there are two roads of righteousness which you can walk upon. You can either walk on the road of self-denial or self or, or, or legalism, um, uh, or you can walk upon the road of believing in him who the Father has sent. You cannot make yourself righteous enough, but through the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are made holy. We are made righteous. We are made acceptable before God. Those of us who are in Christ today, you and I are as righteous as Jesus Christ. You are clothed in robe, a robe of righteousness, and God does not hold one thing against you. Meditate on the fact that you have been made righteous by Christ. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord, you can simply bow your head, open your heart, and say this prayer. And I'll say it slowly. If that's someone who's watching this video, you can repeat this. If you say it and you believe it in your heart, then you too will have eternal life uh, in relationship with God. And it would go something like this. God, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me alive spiritually. Make me righteous. Uh, that the, the righteousness that you want me to be and uh, and uh, at that moment God's Spirit will come and dwell in your life and in, in your heart that is when you will discover that you are born again or born of the Spirit so you can say that and say amen um, and then you can spend the rest of your life and eternity rejoicing in the finished work of uh, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I hope this has been helpful and informative. Uh, our next study will be uh, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4, verses 9 through 16. Thank you for viewing and good day.